some patients are in much better shape than others. Obviously, sometimes we don't even know that one of our members has been declared clinically dead for hours or even days, and they're going to be generally in much worse shape. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, we do have warning where they're at the bedside, and we can begin our processes within seconds of legal death being declared. We will return to that interview later on in the program. This is Asia News Weekly, the podcast featuring news commentary and analysis from the Asia-Pacific region. You've got to read between the lines when looking at this whole THAAD and Asia issue. The rhetoric continues in the South China Sea, and Thailand tries to pat itself on the back. These stories and more are coming up next on the April 24th edition of Asia News Weekly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Asia News Weekly. I, of course, am your host, Steve Miller, and it is my absolute pleasure to be with you here today. So thank you really so much for joining me. Let's go ahead and get started with our very first story. Will the U.S. or won't it deploy THAAD to East Asia and specifically South Korea? The answer to that question really depends on who you talk to and if you believe what you hear. Last week, North Korea warned that the United States ambassador to South Korea could face a bigger mishap than a knife attack to his face last month if he does not stop insulting North Korea with laughable accusations. This was in response to statements made by Ambassador Mark Lippert, noting that if the DPRK halted its nuclear program and changed its stance on human rights violations, it would be rewarded. North Korea usually characterizes such remarks as provocative, threatening, and leading down a path towards war. Hyun Young Chul, the chief of Pyongyang's People Armed Forces, said, quote, The United States and South Korea have pushed forward with joint military exercises despite our demand for their suspension. Tension on the Korean peninsula has reached a boiling point. Hyun added that Pyongyang will continue to beef up its military unless the United States stops its hostile policies. Are tensions really at a boiling point? No. Of course not. Absolutely nothing has changed on the ground. But one thing, well, it may have changed just a little bit. The United States has really been trying to sell North Korea as a major potential threat. Testifying before Congress, General Curtis M. Scaparotti, commander of the U.S. Forces Korea, and Admiral Samuel L. Locklear, commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, agreed with a recent assessment from Admiral Bill Gortney commander of NORAD and the U.S. Northern Command, which is responsible for defending the homeland from missile attack, that the North Korean mobile launcher KN-08 can carry a nuclear weapon as far as the United States. This is despite North Korea never having test-fired that specific missile. The fact he believes North Koreans have had time and the capability to miniaturize a nuclear warhead. He said it is critical for the U.S.-Korea alliance to build a layered and interoperable BMD, ballistic missile defense, capability, end quote. Even on his latest visit to the region, U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter noted, our newest and best things are being deployed to this part of the world, as it is demonstrated once again with the recent missile launches, North Korea is intent on continued provocation. And this is where we get into THAAD. Ash Carter says the story is that Washington hasn't formally discussed deployment of THAAD with any nation. However, Admiral Locklear said the United States has been in discussions about the potential deployment of additional THAAD batteries beyond the one that's in Guam on the Korean Peninsula. So while talks aren't officially taking place, it does appear that at least some discussions are being bounced around upon the table. All the discussions use North Korea as a threat for its developing ICBMs, or at least miniaturized nuclear weapons, as justifications for deploying THAAD. Even infographics show as much. But the real reason THAAD might be coming to South Korea is China. Even the DPRK knows that. North Korea's Hyun Young Chol even said, the United States is revealing its true colors to confront China and Russia. Taking a closer look at the region, China, North Korea, and Russia have all spoken against deploying THAAD to the region, saying it would unnecessarily raise tensions. 
Of those warning against THAAD deployment in Asia, China has been the most vocal. Jing Kai, writing in The Diplomat, identifies two possible reasons for China's behavior. One, it would show China that the defense ties Seoul has with Washington trumps all other relationships. And two, it could cause a major headache for Beijing, since Kim may blame Xi for not being able to prevent THAAD's deployment, which could then spur North Korea to further develop its own weapons programs, putting China in a bind since it would have to act not only to protect the DPRK, but also work to reel it in. Now make no mistake, North Korea does pose a threat, albeit a small one at this stage. It simply doesn't have the arsenal yet to do much damage beyond Seoul. Given time, it will. Yes, THAAD being deployed might be an effective weapon against future ICBMs launched by the DPRK, However, a more immediate use for this technology is to place pressure on China. And that, my friends, is the lens in which to view all these discussions with. Now, coming up later in the podcast, General Prayut Chanacha and the Thai Constitution. Last week on the podcast, I discussed China's continued push in the South China Sea and that while no country in the world buys into the nine-dash line, Beijing clings to rhetoric that it has absolute sovereignty in the area and can do whatever it wants, despite agreements in place with ASEAN member states. To that end, new satellite images of the work being conducted by China on the Fiery Cross Reef have been released. It shows rapid progress in the dredging up of the sea and building a landmass capable of supporting an airstrip. In fact, some estimate that when the project is completed, the resulting airstrip could measure 3 kilometers in length. Additional imagery shows China extending another airstrip in the Paracel Islands, an area rich with natural resources. It's also a lucrative shipping lane where as much as 5 trillion U.S. dollars of trade passes annually. In another area, Chinese Coast Guard vessels shoot away Filipino fishing vessels in an area where they had traditionally made catch. U.S. Senator John McCain, chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, called the Chinese moves, quote, aggressive. He said China's actions demonstrated a need to move more military resources into the region and boost cooperation with Asian countries worried by China. The senator said, quote, When any nation fills in 600 acres of land and builds runways, and most likely is putting in other kinds of military capabilities in what is international waters, it is clearly a threat to where the world's economy is going, has gone, and will remain for the foreseeable future. End quote. In my opinion, Senator McCain is absolutely right to be worried. In fact, it's what I've been saying for the past year, and really what as much China has said recently. These outposts will have some military purposes. The Center for Strategic and International Studies said runway work is about one-third complete, but these projects might help China press its territorial claims. The CSIS also stated that currently the artificial islands were too small and vulnerable, both to weather and wartime targeting, to support major forward deployment of military forces, but that they could sustain long-distance sea and air patrols. Philippine President Aquino once more brought up the stalled code of conduct for the South China Sea, a document signed both between China and ASEAN member states, but never ratified. China, of course, once more rebuffed any talk that its actions were anything but legal, saying, quote, China's work on some islands and reefs in the Nan Sha Islands falls entirely within its sovereignty, which neither affects nor targets any nation, nor threatens international shipping routes and fisheries, end quote, said Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei at a regular press briefing. And on Monday of this week, the Philippines and the United States began their annual 10-day balikatan exercises, means shoulder to shoulder. President Aquino said that the drills aren't aimed at China, but geared towards offering a deterrent aspect to any entity, be it a country or Islamic radicals. Aquino also warned the world that it should fear China's actions in the South China Sea, and I believe he's right. The United States and the Philippines state that their position is to uphold the rule of law and to seek out a diplomatic solution. 
But if China continues to hold fast to the notion that the area is intrinsically theirs and ignore previous agreements they've made with respect to the South China Sea, then really, what road are we left to travel down? Coming up in just a few minutes, how what once was science fiction is now science fact and may help save a little girl. Well, my friends, this was the week we finally got a chance to see the draft constitution from Thailand. This is the 20th national charter for the nation since 1932. It was created by a 36-member constitution drafting committee. Many of the proposed measures in the new constitution are controversial, like the granting of amnesty to all those who participated in last year's coup and selecting a prime minister by parliamentary vote rather than by direct election. Some say these measures are designed to keep coup organizer and junta leader Preyut Chanacha in power. In a speech last Friday, Preyut said, quote, All the time frames that I had set out, I've never deviated from them. I don't want to stay in power. I've never received any benefits, only some compliments and much criticism. End quote. This is, of course, referring to human rights groups and the United Nations condemning his use of military courts rather than civilian ones and the implementation of Article 44. The new draft document comes in at 130 pages with 315 articles. The National Reform Council will spend the week debating the document, something that's being carried on live television and radio for all to witness. Another major concern of the newly fashioned document is the removal of direct elections for senators. According to an editorial in The Nation, of the 200 senators required, only 77 could claim to have at least been partially elected. Voters in 77 provinces would cast ballots for, quote, selected candidates. Another 65 senators would be nominated from professional associations, 15 to be exact, and from among high-ranking government officials, 20, while the other 30 would be designated, quote, experts in their respective fields. The remaining 58 senators will come from a selection process that, again, has yet to be defined. The editorial also notes, giving some people more rights than others is a concept doomed for failure. And that is the general feeling of many analysts. They say that the draft is aimed at limiting the power of political parties and an assault on the process that kept the Shinawats in power. Debates over this draft constitution will conclude this weekend, and then any recommendations for changes will need to be submitted before the end of May. Now, if approved, the constitution could be made the governing document of the land as early as September. Now, if you're so inclined to read the unofficial English translation of the draft constitution, you can visit asianewsweekly.net, click on the show notes, and retrieve a PDF file. Also on the democracy front this week, Hong Kong unveiled its formal proposal for the 2017 elections for the city's chief executive. It's a plan that mirrors what was unveiled in Beijing last August, and pro-democracy advocates are already calling it a farce. What else is happening in this Pacific region? Well, coming up in just a few minutes, a roundup of stories you may have missed. When we look at our lives today and compare it to, say, 30 years ago, much of what we saw in science fiction films has become reality. It's science fact. I mean, think about it. In your pocket, you have a mobile phone, a cell phone. It possesses more computing power than the computers NASA used to put a man on the moon. And those computers used to actually take up an entire floor of a building. Physicians use lasers every day in surgeries, and individuals can be cryogenically preserved with the hope that one day in the future, medical science will evolve enough to not only revive them, but cure them of their disease. Now this brings me to this story. Making the rounds this week is the tale of a two-year-old Thai girl. She was born with a very rare form of pediatric brain cancer. In an attempt to beat the odds, she underwent aggressive chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and numerous neurosurgeries. But unfortunately, it just wasn't enough. She was pronounced dead on January 8th of this year, but that's not the end of her story. 
After being pronounced dead, a team from the Alcor Life Extension Foundation cryogenically preserved her. Her parents hope that one day in the future, she can actually be revived and cured. Joining me on the phone right now from Scottsdale, Arizona, is Dr. Max Moore, president of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. So I, I have to ask you, this, this whole notion of cryogenically preserving individuals, in a nutshell, how does it all work? Well, it's really just based on the principles of physics and cold and the fact that as you slow down, as you cool down biological systems, the molecular activity slows down and metabolism eventually ceases. So the way we think of cryonics really is that it's simply an extension of emergency medicine. If you think back 50 or 60 years before we had CPR and so on, if somebody stopped breathing, if their heart stopped beating, we would have said they're dead and that was it. We forget about them. But today we routinely revive them and they often go on to be quite healthy and fine for many years to come. So the idea of cryonics really is we're saying that the same is true today. When today's doctors declare you dead, what they're really saying is given today's medicine, today's technology, there's nothing much more they can do for that person. Maybe they could revive them temporarily, but it's just not really worth the trouble and the agony. So what we say is give them to us. We're going to protect their cells, and we're going to plummet their temperature to a very, very low level, a point to which there is no molecular activity whatsoever. The patient can then wait in that state for 50 years, 100 years, as long as it takes, and they'll be in essentially the same condition as when they started. And imagine how much technological progress they'll be in, in say, a century. Uh, it probably will be enormous, and so there's a good chance that we'll be able to not only re reverse the condition that caused the fatality, but also to actually rejuvenate the person and bring them back in a fresh young body. That, that's absolutely amazing. Now, we're speaking this week about this young child from Thailand who was two years old. Going into this process, were there any unique challenges in working with someone so young as opposed to an adult? Oh, yes, very much so. This is by far the youngest patient we've ever had. Previously, our youngest patient was 21. Uh, so you know, a girl who's short of a third birthday, uh, there were a number of unique challenges, partly because of her age and partly because of the sheer distance from us. We're based here in Scottsdale, Arizona. So having a patient in Thailand was obviously you know, logistically very difficult. The idea was really that she would relocate here, as many of our patients do to a local hospice. It makes it very easy for us to respond. But that really turned out not to be possible. So we actually sent our medical response director and a, a neurosurgeon who works with us over to Thailand. And fortunately, because of the family had resources and were extremely determined, we were able to uh, cryoprotect the cells, which essentially means that we protect against any ice crystal formation and protect the integrity of the cells right there in Thailand and then transport her back here on dry ice, which is very, very cold at minus 78 degrees C before doing the full cool down to liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, so it was difficult because of the distance, but also because you know she was very, very small, and so that's why we sent uh, a very experienced neurosurgeon to do the surgery to access you know, very small blood vessels, because it's really very important that we remove as much blood and other fluids as possible and replace them with, with this cryoprotectant solution. The cryoprotectant you can think of as a kind of a medical-grade antifreeze that minimizes the damage done as we cool the patient down. Ah, okay. Now, of course, the hope is that one day we'll see these patients revive. Now, how far away are we from actually seeing that? That question I always have to frustrate people with because it's really impossible to answer. Uh, I can give a very wide range of possibilities, but I have to give a caveat that there really isn't any one date because some patients are in much better shape than others. Obviously, sometimes we don't even know that one of our members has been declared clinically dead for hours or even days, and they're going to be generally in much worse shape. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, we do have warning where they're at the bedside and we can begin our processes within seconds of legal death being declared. So they're generally going to be in much better shape. Uh, another factor is that over time we get better at doing this and that the technology improves, the cryoprotectant solution improves, and so we uh, probably preserve the patients under better conditions. So there will be no one particular day or year that everybody comes back. Um, but if you say, okay, when might you start bringing back even the best preserved patients? Um, I'm going to say, at the most extremely optimistic, and I think it's too optimistic, uh, but if you believe someone like Ray Kurzweil and his idea of a technological singularity where essentially super intelligent machines can solve all our problems, then the earliest would be 30 years. But uh, I think it's more likely between 50 at the lowest end, and I can't really imagine it being much more than 100 years. 
but there's so many uncertainties that you know, really that's a guessing game. The main point is it doesn't matter that much because once you're cryopreserved, you can wait for as long as it takes and you're not getting any worse. We've kept you in a completely stable state. Well, that brings me to my next question. We're talking about being revived 30, 50, maybe 100 years down the road. How does one mentally prepare going into this? There's one issue, of course, preparing yourself that you're going to die possibly. Uh, The other thing is waking up 100 years later. I mean, what process goes into that? Well, you know, members who sign up with us generally tend to be more adventurous and perhaps courageous of spirit than the average person because most people actually – most people don't say that, well, it can't possibly work, because if you explain the technology and show the evidence, they say, well, okay, yeah, I guess there is a chance it'll work. But they're actually terrified that it will work, because they think, I don't want to come into a future where everything will be different, and I, you know, my schools will be obsolete. So those who do go ahead and make these arrangements tend to be a little bit more bold. They see it as more of an experiment and uh, an adventure. And also, I think that the idea is that many people are afraid of the future because they think it's going to be a horrible place because all the science fiction that we see in TVs and movies, it's always dystopic. It's always a bad future. And I actually think that's extremely unlikely. If you look at the long run of human history, things get better over time. Uh, There is no place in the past that I'd rather live than today. And so long as we don't really make a mess of things, I think the world we wake up into is going to be a pretty good one. If the world's really bad, if we run out of resources and we're all poor, then we won't come back anyway, so you have nothing to lose. So I think any world we do come back in will have opportunities. And I think that... um, you, know, you can actually take your money with you. There are ways of setting up trust funds to, to take money with you. Um, but you know, people think about this. People have woken from comas who've been essentially unconscious for decades, and it takes them a little while to get going, but they can get back into life. There are Aboriginal Australians who've moved to New York City. Well, I can't imagine the jump will be much bigger than that. And if Cryonix really becomes popular, I think there'll be a professional team of people there ready to help to you know, reintegrate you and rehabilitate you. Um, but for me, the, you know, the bottom line comes down to, do I want to die because I'm uncertain about the future, or do I want to continue enjoying my life and creating and producing and you know, doing all the good things that life makes possible? Well, yeah, and if we talk about this young child, you know, she's just shy of her third birthday. Is there going to be uh, counselors or a team ready to prepare her for her new life when she is revived? Well, you know, from uh, from what we understand, seven members of a family will also be making arrangements for cryopreservation. So uh, she won't be alone when she comes back. She'll be surrounded by family members, assuming this does work. Uh, and that's also assuming that we, they need to be cryopreserved in the first place. It is possible, and of course this is what all of us hope, that we won't have to be, cry, be cryopreserved. This is really a last resort. You know, we want to stay alive, and we're hoping that anti-aging medicine will advance fast enough that uh, before we get too old, we'll learn to stop the aging process and reverse it. So I'm, that's what I'm hoping for myself, and I'm sure they're hoping they won't actually have to die of old age, and they'll still be there uh, when she comes back. But if not, you know, they, they will have the arrangements, and they'll be there. People can actually put in their paperwork in their contract that please don't bring me back until you can also bring back my spouse or my son or my father, that kind of thing. So uh, there are ways of arranging it so that you'll, you will not be alone when you come back. And that certainly includes Matherin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Max Moore is president of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Thank you so much for your time this week. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, I would love to hear your opinion on cryonics, on cryogenically preserving individuals. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? What are the ethical implications? Please leave your thoughts in the comments on Facebook and Twitter. Now, on tomorrow's Asia Now podcast, I'll be joined by Jonathan Miller of the East West Institute, and we'll be discussing the lingering issues between South Korea and Japan. There have been some other fascinating stories taking place in the region, so let's take a quick look. First up, Malaysian political cartoonist Zunar, who faces up to 43 years in prison for sedition, says that despite that threat, he's going to continue doing what landed him in hot water. Quote, You can chain my hands, you can chain my legs, you can chain my neck or my body, but I will keep drawing, he said. Adding, I will keep drawing until the last drop of my ink. End quote. The 52-year-old artist has now become the icon of a government trying to suppress criticism. In fact, in recent years, dozens have been charged with the nation's sedition laws, which have recently been made even stronger. 
Australia's east coast was hit by a massive storm with cyclonic force winds. Thus far, four have perished from the high winds, flash floods, and other disasters. Emergency services have received more than 10,000 calls for help. Damage thus far has been estimated at around 100 million U.S. dollars. As of Thursday, 160 schools remain closed and about 200,000 homes and businesses remained without power. Towards the beginning of the week, officials in Thailand announced one of the largest seizures of ivory ever. Weighing four metric tons, authorities placed over 700 tusks on display for reporters. Quote, moving a shipment of four tons halfway around the world is not a trivial undertaking, end quote, said Richard Thomas, global communications coordinator in London for Traffic International, the wildlife trade monitoring network, indicating that a shipment of this size would be indicative of organized crime. This is the largest shipment confiscated in Thailand, but the record for the largest shipment seized goes to Singapore in 2002 at 7.2 tons. Authorities say the ivory originated from the Democratic Republic of Congo and was destined for Laos. A Chinese news service reports that a research team has created a robot that can be controlled by the human brain. Researchers at the National University of Defense Technology in Changsha created the robot and say it can walk forward and backwards as well as make simple turns taking instructions through a cap worn by the operator. Jiang Jun, a doctoral student on the team, says the computer will turn human thoughts into control instructions and send them back to the robot through wireless facility so that we can control it to finish the movements. End quote. Some liken the connection to Avatar, where a marine was able to control a robot with his brain. And finally, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, announced a possible unmanned lunar mission for the physical 2018 year. It is a lofty goal for the first Asian agency to put a satellite in orbit. It had once tried to put together a Mars mission in 1998, but that program was scrapped in 2003. Don't forget to follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook, where I post more stories throughout the week. Well, here we are, friends, towards the end of the podcast. But before I go, a few of your comments from this week. First up, there was a great exchange between Douglas Stingley, Ben Haywood, and Nam Demo Guy regarding China building airfields on reefs in the South China Sea. Tak Erlam commented on our Asia Now podcast, This is an interesting podcast. Very eye-opening. Hard to believe that there are people this evil. Lucas Musser responded to a story we posted during the week about France threatening Indonesia over the execution of one of its citizens. So says the country that used a guillotine up until the 1980s. Red White Dude said, Pakenhei doesn't bring anything new to the presidency. If anything, she represents the old guard and the old way of doing things. Perhaps she was expecting a more docile public on the Sewol disaster. Also commenting on the Sewol protesters clashing with police, Joaquin Menchaca said, These types of events can cause government resets. VB Ninja says, Thanks for keeping us up to date. And Perdomont had this to say on Abe's offering to the Yasukuni Shrine. The idea that a prime minister of a country can't visit a shrine in his own country because another country might complain is ridiculous. South Korea got screwed by its own government in the comfort women issue, and they've been trying to get Japan to pony up again with another apology and money. I say, no way to that. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to leave a comment this past week. I truly do value your opinions, and I love hearing from you. So if you have a thought on any of the stories covered in this week's podcast, please let me know. You can leave it in the comment section. You can leave your thought on Facebook or Twitter. You can even film a video reply or record your audio of you speaking your mind and email it to me. I want to hear from you, and I can't wait to do so. To keep up with more news from the region, follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. You can also send an email to the show with your questions, your comments, and your feedback. That email address is podcast at asiannewsweekly.net. 
If you enjoyed today's program, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. It's quick and easy to do. You can do that on our website, asiannewsweekly.net, or in your favorite podcast application like iTunes or Stitcher. Well, my friends, that's all the time I have this week. One program note, though. I will be taking a little time off next week, so there won't be any Asia Brief podcast Monday through Thursday. However, there will be an Asia Now podcast tomorrow, and Asia News Weekly returns next Friday. All right, that's it for me. Have a great weekend. My name, of course, is Steve Miller, reminding you to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.